Okay, so uh, I want to thank the organizers for, for including me in this event. And uh, as the only person, I guess, from my reckoning from the United States at this event, uh, and given that there's a lot of talk about conservatism and about Islam, then there's an elephant in the room or, or in the geographic space, which is that in the US, uh, especially in the Republican Party, uh, there's been uh, an effort at one-upmanship in terms of who's the most conservative. And uh, it, as part of this effort, uh, it also became uh, an effort to prove that the most conservative is the most anti-Islamic. And uh, in this instance, you probably all know about Donald Trump's uh, statements. And Donald Trump seems to be uh, in a good position to win the Republican nomination. But the runner-up, uh, Ted Cruz, who is uh, uh, rallying many of the other conservatives who are trying to block uh, Donald Trump. Now, something interesting happened just yesterday or the day before with Ted Cruz, which is uh, each of the leading uh, Republicans was asked uh, who their top advisors are or would be. So Donald Trump, being an egomaniac, said, well, when I need advice, I look at the mirror, and uh, the person facing me gives me the advice. And uh, Ted Cruz, uh, one would think that you cannot improve on that, but Ted Cruz did better because uh, he just uh, named his advisors, and his top foreign policy advisor uh, is a man named uh, Frank Gaffney. Uh, the name may not ring a bell, but those who follow closely American politics know that he is the most outrageous Islamophobe in the U.S. And in my book on Islamic finance, I quote him, and I quote some of his statements about the dangers of the Sharia uh, to the U.S. So I think it was necessary, being from the U.S., to have this uh, short disclaimer to begin with. Uh, now, I want to talk about... Uh, Turkey as well. And here there's an interesting story having to do with religion and commerce. And this is a story of the visit to Turkey in 2006 of Pope Benedict, the next to last uh, pope. And so during his visit, uh, he went to the so-called Blue Mosque, which is a 17th century jewel of a, of a monument. And while he was visiting the mosque, something attracted his, attract, uh, his attention as he was leaving the mosque. It was a tableau uh, with a very nice calligraphy inside. So he, he asked the, his guide, uh, what does that say? And the guide uh, said to him that, well, it's basically that uh, a merchant is the beloved of God. Okay, another translation of that uh, uh, religious line is uh, that he who earns his bread is a friend of God. But the logic is, uh, is quite significant because it really shows not only the centrality of commerce and free enterprise, but also the fact that worshippers, uh, when they leave the mosque, it's uh, there's a strong chance that the last thing they will see is a call to commerce. Okay, so uh, in my work on uh, Islamic economics and Islamic finance, I was always very interested in many of those aspects of, uh, of Islam, uh, which also explain why for many centuries uh, Islam uh, was uh, the dominant uh, economic system. Islamic law governed uh, commerce across continents, etc. And... Um, the, the one point that I want to uh, add to uh, what, what, what you've heard before is uh, that not only is the market process and private property uh, quite central, but these must be complemented by an ethical and a legal system. Uh, so, uh, most importantly, uh, there is... Uh, uh, the, 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 the system of Kirad, which became the uh, Mudaraba system in modern finance, which is a forerunner of uh, venture capitalism, uh, as well as many other corporate forms. Uh, but one thing that is interesting about that form of commerce 
is that it existed in the Jahiliya already. You had the, the caravan trades that were organized based on an association of effort and capital. But what Islam brought was ethical norms as well as a legal system that was many centuries in the making. And uh, this is where we can see, uh, again, uh, uh, interesting specificities to Islam. One is the association of uh, merchants with religious scholars. And the existence of religious scholars uh, allowed the merchants to know that what they were doing was uh, religiously acceptable, it was halal. And this is another interesting uh, form of the checks and balances that we see in Islam, in that making money is good, being a merchant is good, but at the same time, in the way you make money, there are rules, uh, primarily moral uh, rules. And then once you're a wealthy person or well-off person, then you have obligations as well uh, to society at large. And uh, uh, these elements must not be uh, forgotten because there are certain controls, outside controls that are necessary for a system put to work well. So I've been teaching a course on Islamic finance uh, uh, in, uh, at, uh, at the Fletcher School for about 11 or 12 years. And the one part of the course that I think is quite central is an explanation of something that many people have never heard of, and it's something called gharar. And uh, I also often do seminars for banks on Islamic finance, and I always realize that most people have a very superficial understanding of gharar, which is often translated superficially as uh, excessive risk-taking. But the reality of gharar is that it is really about asymmetrical information. So it is about the fact that uh, they are, the, the seller very often knows more than the buyer. And in order to avoid exploitation and predatory practices, then there might be certain rules that are rooted in ethics. And this is, I think, extremely important to understand uh, why, for example, Islamic finance uh, did not suffer the way conventional finance did in 2008, because many transactions involving complex derivatives, etc., were forbidden because they involved gharar. So, the, in, another way of, of looking at uh, the Islamic tradition as far as free enterprise is that there's also an essential pragmatism that comes with it. And this pragmatism appears, uh, if you consider the, the, the variety of uh, processes that exist in Islam to mitigate or moderate certain excesses, and in certain cases, to allow for departure from principles. For example, you have the principle of maslaha, or the principle of darura, which would uh, provide for certain exceptions to pre prevailing rules. And uh, I can give you one quick example involving Iran, of all places, uh, on the question of uh, the use of darura. After the revolution in 1979, there was a big religious debate over what to do with the assets, the considerable assets of the Shah, of the former Shah, as well as, as his cronies. And uh, there were debates among the religious hierarchy in uh, Iran. And the majority of the religious scholars said, uh, we cannot confiscate his assets uh, because uh, this would be completely un-Islamic. And this is when uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was politically quite savvy, who prevailed by saying that we can invoke darura, or in Persian transliteration, zarura, uh, which uh, basically says that the overwhelming goal, the, the really most important goal, is to save the Islamic revolution. And in the process, it is uh, acceptable to break the rule. So. Uh, I would want to stress uh, the fact that uh, checks and balances uh, are very important. And I think Turkey, uh, to go back to, to uh, this wonderful country here, uh, in Turkey there's an interesting uh, mechanism of checks and balances, which is all of the secular components of the Constitution that uh, can uh, be uh, mixed 
with the religious element that uh, is, is uh, currently present in the ruling political party and provide uh, this kind of best of both world uh, mix. Thank you very much.